Genesis Christian Radio. Genesis Christian Radio. Okay, Nigel, thanks very much for inviting uh, Genesis Christian Radio down to Hope Bar. Amen. Uh, what was the uh, main purpose of you setting up Hope Barn? Well, um, I was invited to the Cotswolds uh, by uh, a lady who used to draw people from all the denominations who wanted to hear certain topics about Israel or, or uh, healing, gifts of the Spirit, that really they weren't getting in maybe their own churches. And uh, okay. uh, she asked me to come and speak on setting captives free. And there were vicars there and, and even uh, ministers from other denominations. And, and I realized that um, uh, th these topics uh, weren't being uh, 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 attacked in a lot of the churches. And somebody needs to bring those. So I said, Lord, if, if you're moving us to the Cotswolds area, uh, then I, 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 I need a, a, a center where we can bring this teaching. And we, we looked at various properties, but we came along here and we went upstairs and there was a scripture nailed uh, up into the attic and it was 1 Peter 2 verse 12 having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against you as evildoers they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation so this acted as a confirmation then of what the Lord was uh, directing you to do I believe so and then interestingly enough um, we, uh, it, it went to final bids and we didn't, it, it was crawling with developers really and we wanted to use the barn as a meeting place. We didn't want to convert it into anything else and we put a bid in um, which probably was quite low um, but then we heard um, that our bid was accepted. Okay, that's, that certainly seems to be God's hand upon the work that you're doing then. Well, I agree. I arranged to meet the farmer because he sold off all the land to houses and um, he said, oh, he said, this house has been rented out for a long time and it was rented by Christians. And they used to, he pointed at this barn, they used to use this and have meetings and, and use this as a prayer room. Praise and God. I discovered even previous to that, it had been owned by Christians. So this has been uh, rented by Christians um, over, since the 1970s, I think. Wow, okay, so the, uh, the actual ground's got a bit of a genealogy then. Amen, like, uh, just, yes. Just like we see in the uh, first book of Matthew for Jesus. That's right. Okay, so the, um, the venue, is it open to everybody or is it uh, just a particular section of uh, society that we're aiming at? Well, I, I, th uh, I think if we started a church, churches are reluctant to um, no, I pastored a church in, in Reading for 10 years. So it's not a church? It's not a church, no. It, it, we're going to keep it as a teaching venue. Yeah. So people, so it'll be parachurch, if you like. People yeah. from all denominations can come and hear the topics we want to speak okay. on. Okay, well, you've mentioned Israel, uh, uh, Nigel. Israel is obviously very important to you and your teaching. Yes, I, I believe God's end time plan for Israel uh, it, it's all in, in, in shadows and types in scripture uh, and I feel that we need to get a handle on that because um, really Jerusalem is the navel of the whole universe yes. heaven and hell are looking at Jerusalem mm -hmm. and so are we and, and it's God's time clock and we, we, need, we need to know that we need to know what the scripture has to say about it Yes, okay. And of course, uh, you know, the scripture does tell us to pray for the peace of uh, Jerusalem. Amen. And uh, of course, the scripture to me is, is that, uh, you know, the way Jesus uh, went up from this earth is be the place that he comes back to as well. So for me, like you, you've described Jerusalem as a navel. I see that as the center of, of the world. If yes, you know, yes, respect. indeed. Center of the universe, really. Okay. But I, I think in terms of the, uh, the time clock, we're, we're probably two minutes to midnight now. Okay. You know, uh, and, and I just feel that we need this teaching in the body of Christ. If, if God's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle, um, in Revelation 19, it, it talks about the bride made herself ready. Yes. So it, it's not God going to clean up the church. It, 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 it's us. Jesus said it's finished. And so we've got the word. We, we've got to get our act sorted. You know. Okay. So uh, how often do you think you'll be uh, doing teaching days uh, down at Hope Barn? Well, I think at the moment, uh, one a month we've started on. Uh, we, we've, uh, 
got, got one coming up for the ladies. So I'm going to do some men's breakfast. Oh, yes. I'm very keen for headship, for men to raise up in headship. Uh, we're going to be doing in December uh, Israel. Uh, well, you, you mentioned headship in the ladies' days. Uh, why, why do you think headship is so important to uh, uh, the Word of God and the way that our, our world is going? Well, I, I think, you know, the Lord said that the, uh, the head of woman is man and the head of man is God. And, uh, and when you get the order right, you get divine order in the home, uh, kingdom authority, kingdom order. Um, you, you've got safety, you've got happiness. Uh, but uh, the enemy's game plan is to wreck that order. And uh, his agenda, as I said earlier, is, is gender, confusion now. And the, the enemy hates headship and will do anything he can to emasculate males. Okay, so Nigel, if uh, people want to contact you about uh, future events at Hope Barn, how do they do that? Uh, by email, we, we have a Facebook page, uh, uh, which is hope farm, hopebarnthefarm.com, but my, the email address would be Nigel Thompson at hopebarnthefarm.com. Okay. Thank you very much. Many if, you wish, uh, if you wish to contact Nigel and, you, and uh, you didn't get the email address down, please contact us at Genesis Christian Radio. Bless you. Amen. GCR, Genesis Christian Radio, on TuneIn and www.genesischristianradio.com. I've got another one in here. I'm all wired up here. Um, can, anyone, can everyone hear me okay? I, I don't want to use the microphone necessarily. Um, but I will if you can't hear me. I'm not known for my whispering. <laughs> but um, if everybody can hear me, then uh, I'd rather be free to walk around and fix you in the eye and see what God might say. Uh, it's interesting that we, we started these camps, really, uh, what, 17 years ago, Mike? Uh, be, because we felt there were... There were truths not necessarily being taught in every church. Uh, we, we felt strongly that uh, salvation is, is a, a third uh, of the gospel, that healing is a third of the gospel, that deliverance is a third of the gospel, and uh, God's end time plan for Israel. Uh, all these issues we felt were very important to the Lord, and we felt that we needed a camp where we could uh, attract small independent fellowships to come together to, to hear God's truth. And, uh, and this really is what we're about here. We, uh, we, we not so much are planting a church, but we, we want to do teaching days and seminars and uh, bring some of these truths to you by some great speakers, actually, in the country on various subjects. So I, ho I hope we'll see uh, some folk in the future. Can we just pray uh, together uh, just for the Lord's presence, but also for folk coming from London, they've not arrived, for their safety. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we heard earlier that everyone is here by divine appointment, O God. And we pray, Lord, for those coming from London now, Father. We plead the blood of Jesus to cover their vehicles, that they arrive safely, Lord. And Father, we thank you for your presence here, uh, Lord. Uh, Father, it's not the counsellor that sets you free, it's the truth. That sets you free, O oh God. And we pray, Lord, I, I pray you'd give us eye salve on our eyes to see. Father, you'd cut out the excess flesh in our ears that we might hear this morning. Father, deal with our hearts that we might receive the engrafted word, that your word will not return to you void, but accomplish that for which it's sent, O oh God. I pray, Lord, not one person will leave this place without having received from you, Father, that which they've come for. Lord, all we're doing this morning is appropriating the cross. Jesus said it is finished. It's a complete work. Lord, we want to enter in to that completeness, Father. Show us, Lord. Guide us, O oh God. Father, if, if anything I bring this morning or anyone brings that is not of you, not of your word this morning, Lord, uh, strike it from us, Father, from our hearing, Lord. But Lord, we welcome the sweet aroma of Jesus in this place. Each one of us wants to reach out and touch you this morning, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 
the basis, and uh, uh, you've got some papers there. We're, we're doing this on CD. Uh, if you like to have a, a copy of the uh, three CDs, few folk have already asked me who can't be here. It'll be £10 for the three. We'll post them out to you. Do put, uh, there's a book there you can put your name and address down on. Um, and uh, uh, just leave the payment with Lynn before you go. And we'll get them to you. <clears throat> I want to read to you from uh, 2 Timothy. Uh, no, 3 Timothy 3.16. Uh, which is the plumb line for all we teach and believe here at Hope Barn. And uh, I, I, I pray it will be so for all of us. It should be for every Christian. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or woman <clears throat> may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do we agree that is the word of God? Amen. Amen. So that is our plumb line that we should weigh everything by. Uh, when, when you have moves uh, that they say are of God and the word of God is shelved for experiential uh, issues, then it can never be so. The word of God uh, can never be shelved. It, it, it's, uh, it, it's our plumb line for life. It's a, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we, we thank the Lord uh, for his word, which uh, uh, it, was the word, it was the word that became flesh that dwelt among us. And one thing is so important we must lay hold of is that the word must become flesh. The word must become flesh. What does that mean? It must, it must change us. <clears throat> you know, I, I could be up here. There, we have many eloquent teachers in this nation. But does the word become flesh? Do we see uh, then being turned into and changed line upon line, precept upon precept into the likeness of Jesus. You see, I shouldn't be the same Nigel Thompson standing here today as I was a year ago. I should be changing. We should all be changing, amen, which is so important. You know, Christianity is not one of many roads to God. It's the only road to God. All, all the major religions are about seeking God, trying to find God. So many books on finding God, seeking God. But Christianity is the only religion where God comes down and seeks out man. Hallelujah. He chose you. You didn't choose him. Isn't that amazing? That he became a man. He lived as a man. He went through everything we could experience. All the temptation. Torture. Homelessness. Loneliness. Rejection. Starvation. Experienced everything. What other religion can say that? What other head of other religion can say that? And yet, without sin, took our sin upon himself, upon the cross of Calvary. And it is a complete work, folks. We're not here to add anything to the scripture. But we're here to apply it. We're here to apply it because we're very poor at applying the complete work of Christ on the cross for us. That's what this day is all about. The triune Godhead of Father, Son and Holy Spirit can be found from Genesis to Revelation. In Genesis 1, 27, tells us we are made in his image. A triune God made a tripartite being. What does that mean? Well, you have a tricycle has three wheels. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says this. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ he who calls you is faithful who also will do it that is the right order spirit soul and body you are a spirit you have a soul and they live in a body you know that was the divine order that mankind was created in in Adam and Eve I say was because since the fall Satan managed to reverse the order and now we see body soul and spirit that's what most most of us live by 
until you're born again. Everyone takes their body on holiday, get it suntanned, dress it up in the latest fashion. Our bodies are the most important thing to us. We go to the doctors with aches and pains and as, as they're wearing out. But our bodies are going back to the dust from which they came. Most people don't even engage their spirit. They don't even know they have one. And of course, the world lives by their soulish appetites. People often say to me, well, you take nothing with you when you die. Well, that isn't true, folks. You take your character with you when you die. That's what you take with you. You see, our personalities, they're unique and different. None of us are the same. God broke the mold when he made each one of you. But our character, he wants the same. He wants our characters like Jesus. All our characters should be the same. Do you see that? That's what he's about, changing us into his likeness. So a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a destiny. Character is so important to God, and it's so important to us. Our spirit man is that part of us that communes with God. Our soul houses our emotions, our appetites, and will. The flesh houses the five senses of sight, smell, hear, taste, and touch. The world lives through its soulish emotions. Feelings are everything. Oh, and so easily hurt, aren't they? Aren't our feelings so easily hurt? Love is reduced to a feeling. Yet scripture says it's a decision of your will. You choose to love. You don't have to feel love. It's a choice. We love the down and out. We love the poor. We love the homeless. We love our enemies. Hello? How can that be a feeling? It's a choice of our wills. The world's conned us into a feeling. And now it would seem even gender is no longer decided by X and Y chromosomes, but a feeling. A feeling. And you're not allowed to challenge it. My goodness me, it seems only nature and the animal kingdom aren't confused. <laughs> Let me tell you this, and I've learned this over the... What, what I'm teaching you today, much of it I've experienced. You know, we can, we can preach the word positionally, that we know that potentially, as we heard this morning, we, we can get a mountain to move, can't we? And positionally, we can raise the dead in Jesus' name. Who believes positionally you can raise the dead in Jesus' name? Amen. But if I ask for a show of hands how many have raised the dead in Jesus' name, <laughs> one went up there. We probably, if I asked that in Africa, you'd see a lot go up. Do you know that? Or India. Dr. Jesus is the only doctor they've got. And they do see God using them to raise the dead. But if I preach the word experientially, having raised the dead, boy, there'd be a power and authority with that message, wouldn't there? Because I'd been there. I'd experienced it. And you see, that's what God wants us. He says, taste and see. Taste and see. I, I think once you've tasted and seen and experienced the, the, the provision, the power of God in your life, the love of God, it's very hard to backslide. It's very hard to deny that which you know to be true. You see, we're in the world where, like we're in a darkened room and we're groping the walls for the handle and we can't find the handle anywhere. Then all of a sudden our hand lands on the handle and we open the door and, and we walk through into blazing light. But then to turn round and walk back into that room of your own free will... You're not the same as everyone else in that room, are you? They've yet to find the handle. You found it, and you've chosen to go back. The Bible says like a dog returns to its vomit. 
You know, the world doesn't like someone who's rejected the Lord. The world doesn't like a backslider because they think, well, I haven't found truth yet. You found it and rejected it. How does that make them feel? Too holy to enjoy, too sinful to enjoy your holiness, and too holy to enjoy your sinfulness. Oh, we've all been there, folks. We've all been there. The enemy, the enemy's agenda is gender today. The enemy's agenda is gender. Gender confusion. Because he hates male headship. He hates male headship. You see, the church is a miniature kingdom. And the family is a miniature church. And where there's headship in society, society is sound. The children are under authority. The household runs with the anointing of the Lord. Kingdom principles, kingdom discipline. But when you remove that headship, it's mayhem, absolute mayhem. In Deuteronomy 22.5, God makes it quite clear that cross-dressing is an abomination to him. A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so are an abomination to the Lord your God. He continues down in verse 9, you shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed. He, then he continues to, you, you shall not plow in verse 10 with an ox and a donkey together. In verse 11, you shall not wear a garment of different sorts, such as wool and linen mixed together. Why? Separation. Separation. You know, with the advent of unisex shops in the swinging 60s, the erosion started in society. All the lines were gradually blurred. The man's role constantly under attack. Even the very physical and often brutal sport of rugby is now played by females. You see, the male role constantly under attack in society. Let's remove headship. Let's remove, you see, we're all equal in God's sight. But man is appointed to lead. He's appointed to lead. And you can choose to be uh, socially emasculated in your family you can abdicate that headship but you will be judged on your wife's decisions that you should have made whoa I'd rather be judged on my own decisions than somebody else's wouldn't you <laughs> Deuteronomy 23 verse 1 tells us that an emasculated male could not enter the congregation of the Lord. I mentioned that at camp. And as soon as I'd mentioned that, uh, the next day I was approached by a lady who said that uh, her... Speak up. Her nephew uh, came to the Lord at one of our camps and she would like to be baptized. I said, she? She said, well, she's had a sex change. And now uh, she's a male. And I said, whoa. So I'm challenged straight away, you see, on this. What, what do I do? What do I do with this? And I said, well, I, I'm going to go away and pray about it, and I'll come back. And she brought the, uh, the, the young man, uh, dressed as a lady, in that evening to see me. And I explained that I could only baptize you um, in the gender in which God created you. I couldn't baptize you in any other. And she said, well, do you mean that if he just dressed as a, a man then, you'd baptize him? I said, well, I can't do that because there's much more there. We'd need to counsel the person and, and help them get, get through on the issues. Um, you know, I, 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 it's, uh, 
It's not that simple. It's not that simple. Don't underestimate the power of the soul. We should never appeal to the soul when worshipping God because the soul always tries to emulate the spirit. And you can have soulish worship that appeals to the soul. It's like a rock concert. But God never speaks. There's no desire. I don't get a word of God. Uh, that nobody gets a prophecy. Nobody hears from God. God's not speaking because we're on the level of the soul. And the soul loves emotion. And we have to be so careful that we don't come to the Lord on a soulish level. That's why our worship, you see, it's so important that we, we start in the outer courts, if you like, the court of the Gentiles, and we move through into the inner courts, the court of Israel, through the women's courts, into the holy place, and then the holies of holies. When we're in the holies of holies, Holy Spirit's just fallen on me. When we're in the holies of holies, we're adoring him. We're worshipping him. We've come through in praise and now we're adoring. We're ad adoring the Lord. We're gazing upon his beauty. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, the chorus goes. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of the earth shall grow fame, faintly dim in the light of his glory and grace. There's no place for the soul there, folks. It's deep calling unto deep. Spirit calling unto spirit. That's where change is made. That's where things happen. That's where lives are changed. In James 3, you see, our soul is in a fallen state. When Jesus was explaining to Peter that he has to go to the cross and what he has to do, what did Peter say? It shan't happen. It's not going to happen, Lord, you know. And, uh, and, and Jesus rebuked him and said, get thee behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God. Why? Because he was speaking through his soul. Do you see that? He was speaking to Jesus through his soul. But why would Jesus say, get thee behind me, Satan? Well, James 3 15 explains that to us. You see, the Bible interprets itself. The Bible always interprets itself. The, the old, the new in the old concealed. The old in the new revealed. Very important. Verse 14, I'll, I'll read from 3.14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. And that word sensual in the Greek is soulish. It's soulish. You see, when, when, when Jesus said to the Pharisees, you take after your father the devil, you see, our souls are fallen. And that's why we have to bring them to the cross. We have to bring them to the cross. The enemy is always trying to counterfeit the spirit through the soul. People, people use soulish power to manipulate people. Wherever you come across manipulation, domination and control, you come against witchcraft. That is a definition of witchcraft. Manipulation, domination and control. You have Christians praying soulish prayers over people, manipulating them. And you wonder why you're struggling in certain areas. Because those soulish prayers that they're praying out of the flesh, thinking they're praying the will of God, have power over you, you see. And it's so important that we understand this, we break ourselves free from this. And that we pray God's will over people. David and Jonathan's soul were knit together, 1 Samuel 18, 1. Becoming one flesh with someone through intercourse causes a strong soul tie. Genesis 2, 24. 
1 Corinthians 6, 16 warns us about becoming one flesh with a prostitute. A soul tie with a prostitute. You see, these will affect our lives. I say to teenagers, when you sleep with somebody, you sleep with every person they've ever slept with. You must realise that. And the person who has many, many sexual partners ends up with many problems spiritually. Fear, anxiety, stress, panic attacks, all kinds of byproducts of their spirit man in such turmoil, their soul in such turmoil. And you see, becoming one flesh with somebody is a bridge. And all the demonic come across that bridge. So they suffer with depression. Now you're suffering with depression. They have issues in their life that you suddenly find that you have. Because of that ungodly soul tie. The spirit takes authority over the soul, which is why fasting is so efficacious for the Christian life. Because it's through denial that the soul is brought under submission to the spirit man. The apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9.27 that he disciplines his body. I believe that to be by the rod of fasting. And these God is restoring to the church today prayer and fasting. You see, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. That makes the cross of Christ a complete work, lacking nothing. You were already healed 6,000 years ago. You were already saved 6,000 years ago. You were already delivered 6,000 years ago. You just appropriated it in your lifetime. That's it. That's it. But to suggest a Christian can't be bound is a nonsense. Christians get sick, don't they? Yet by the stripes of Jesus, we are and we were healed. So how come Christians get sick? They get sick and they die, but they go to glory. You can be bound and go to glory. We have to appropriate that healing and that deliverance. That's what these days are about. That's what this teaching is about. You see, possession speaks of ownership. And yes, if you're out there in the world, I believe you could be possessed in the spirit by a, a demonic presence and it would be powerful and the ownership would be powerful. But if you're the Lord's possession, then you can't be possessed, can you? But the problem is, in the, in the King James authorised, they translated to have a demon problem as possession. And it's caused a lot of issues theologically for people. I was, doing a, I was on a radio station and, um, and doing a talk, and it was a phone-in. And, um, uh, and this lady was in such a state because she loved the Lord, she was a born-again Christian, but she had this besetting sin she couldn't get rid of. And she was condemned by it. And she was ringing in. And I said, my dear, you need deliverance, that's all. That's all, you need deliverance. You need to find someone who ministers in this ministry. But isn't it ridiculous to have to say you have to find someone? We should all be ministering in this ministry, shouldn't we? I've had pastors bring people to me for deliverance. And I said, brother, you can do this. We can all do this. I don't have a particular gift in this, but I have a particular desire to see the body of Christ free. Hallelujah. Revelation 19, the bride made herself ready. You know, God isn't going to suddenly clean up the church without spot or wrinkle and suddenly visit us and we're all going to shake and wake up, you know, changed. He's done all the changing he's going to do. It's the application of the cross now. Be careful not to confuse sin and sins. Sin is what we are or were if you're born again. Justification deals with the sin nature. 
Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Just as if you never sinned. That's what justification is. The two thieves on the cross, either side of Jesus, represent the whole world, the whole of mankind. One went up, one went down. One recognized Jesus as the Son of God and believed on him and was justified. No time for sanctification, folks. No time for working out his salvation through fear and trembling. He was justified. One denied him. And his eternity was sealed in hell. Represent the whole of mankind. Philippians 2.12 You see, we have to work out our salvation, but it's both a standing and a process. And I believe, you see, Romans 10.10, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. We know that. It never talks about the intellect. You can't reason anybody into the kingdom of heaven with this. When JWs come and knock my door, I never, do, I never go into tennis with them with scripture. I go straight for the heart. Do you like yourself? What? What do you mean, do I like myself? They can't handle that at all. You, you know, you're made in the image of God. You know, do you like yourself? They, they don't believe, they, don't, they, they have no assurance of salvation at all. No assurance of salvation. That's why it's all through works. But they'll always have a senior one whose uh, conscience is seared. You can't get through to the senior one. But the one in training you can, go for the one in training. <laughs> every time. Because they're training them every time. I've seen them break into tears. I've seen the, uh, the senior one get angry and drag the younger one off and, and challenge them. Say, well, let's pray together. You know, we'll, you, we'll pray and ask the Lord to reveal truth to us. Oh, they won't do that. They won't pray with you. They won't pray with you. And uh, I went, when I was doing a house, they knocked on the door and I'd just come back from uh, uh, Africa and I'd, I'd seen the most amazing uh, miracles God moved powerfully and I, I was on fire for God and they said oh uh, we're Christians I said no you're not you're Jehovah's Witnesses I said but come on in and uh, the younger one started uh, her eyes were filling up and, and the uh, older one was getting very angry and dragged her off and uh, one of them uh, gave their lives to the Lord and came to our church and she said oh she said um, in Kingdom Hall she said your name is on a hit list <laughs> And uh, we're not allowed to knock on your door. <laughs> but that was 28 Russell Street. But the Lord, one day while we were pray praying, said, lay your hands on the wall and claim next door for me, which was number 30. So I said, Lord, I lay my hands on the wall and I claim next door for you, in Jesus' name. Well, we ended up buying that, cut a long story short, uh, for, the, for the sum of money the Lord gave us. And uh, I'm in there working. Knock on the door, it's Jehovah's Witnesses. I said, come on in. And they got so angry, they sent the elders around to see me in the end. <laughs> you see, justification is the beginning of your walk by faith. Sanctification is both a standing and a process. Sanctification means set apart. So, uh, a, a pen is sanctified when you start using it, you see, because it's being used for what it was meant for. It means set apart. Translated in the Greek, it means to make holy. Hagiamos. Hagias, hagiasmos. To make holy. Hagiasmos. And so you are set apart. Justification very much sets us apart. Amen? For God to make holy. So really, what am I saying about sanctification? Well, sanctification is, is both a standing and a process. And I guess Hebrews uh, brings this out. Uh, it sounds like a contradiction, but it's not. Uh, Hebrews 10.10 10, uh, says this, By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. But then in 
uh, 14 as we go down, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. You see, so that's it. It's a standing and a process. And so what does that process mean? Well, it means dealing with the soul, folks. That's what it means. It means being turned into the likeness of Jesus, line upon line. You see, it, it's, uh, it, 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 that's why we have to work it out. We have to work it out. Work out our salvation. Just because you're struggling with some bondage doesn't mean you're not saved. And just because you've heard, well, a Christian can't be bound or have a demon, um, then I can't be saved. But it's a nonsense. You know, I've come to realise it's possible to have a redeemed heart but a heathen mind. Obviously, isn't it? When we are supposed to have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16 tells us. We're supposed to be able to think like God. Which is why Paul tells us in Romans 12 too, we have to renew our minds. We have to renew our minds. Without, it's, it's interesting, let, let me read that. To, let me take you to that. It's a, an interesting scripture. Because without that renewing of our minds, you see, the program, you've been, you've been programmed through your experiences of life. At, from childhood on. That's programmed you, and you view life through those eyes. And so we can, we can only reprogram the computer with the software of the Word of God. That's it. We can, and, and as we begin to, people say to me, what's your opinion on this? I said, well, I don't have an opinion, but I'll give you God's opinion on it, which is my opinion. <laughs> you see? Some may say, oh, well, I, I believe there are certain exceptional circumstances in where abortion is accepted. You know, rape is one. And I said, but that's not God's opinion. That's your opinion. You know, I said, that's fine. That's your opinion. But it's not God's opinion. There are no circumstances where bo abortion is, is acceptable to God. Period. And so we have to get to that point where we embrace God's opinion. And uh, um, Romans uh, 12 uh, is interesting because he's saying, and do not be conformed to this world. That word world in the Greek means aeons or cosmos. Do not be conformed to the spirit of this age. That's what it means. Do not be conformed to the spirit of this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that perfect and acceptable and perfect will of God. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Without the renewing of our minds, folks, we can't prove the perfect will of God for our lives. That's what it means. Without the renewing of our minds, we can't prove the perfect will of God for our lives. If we're still thinking like the old man, oh, you're going to glory, you're justified, you love the Lord. But for this lifetime, you're not getting it right. You're not going through the right doors. You're going round the mountain, hello. I'm fed up with going round the mountain, are you? Come on. We've got to be, and I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet, but I'm determined to. I'm determined to get there. And it annoys me when I hear preachers preaching, uh, you know, Preachers who preach a Christian can't be bound, and they're huge, they're fat. I said, well, brother, you've got a problem with food. You know, you are bound, and you're preaching we can't be bound. It's ridiculous. We have to realize that there's bondage there. And we can be free, hallelujah. We can be free. By renewing our minds, reprogramming the computer in the Word of God. You know, when you meet a Christian who has renewed their mind to think like God and brought their soul under the authority of their spirit man, 
you will see a type of living ark. Three things were in the ark. The tablets of stone, the word of God, the jar of manna, the provision of God, and Aaron's rod that budded, the power of God. You may be born again and have God's word. You might have even experienced God's provision. But I don't believe you can operate in his power without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's... Unity is so important. When there's unity, there he commands the blessing, life forevermore. The oil on Aaron's cloak started on his head, came down his beard onto his cloaks. Amen? When God has unity, one spirit, one voice, one mind, that it's like an orchestra that you can't hear the instruments anymore because it's a cacophony of sound. We're all moving. It's like birds flying together. They know when to swoop and dive, don't they? And they do it like watching a ballerina dance. That's where the body of Christ needs to be, folks. We're all hearing his voice. We're all moved together. Everybody's of the same opinion. Everybody's of the same spirit. And you see, it's no different for the man created in his image, spirit, soul and body. When your spirit man is flowing in unity with your soul and your flesh and you're all moving together, God can use you. God can use you powerfully. Because the whole thing's under submission. It's under submission of your spirit and God is over authority of your spirit. Because we worship him in spirit and truth and God is spirit. And so when God's in charge of your spirit and your spirit's in charge of you, he can do anything with you. Anything with you. And we've got a history of, of famous men and women that God has used mightily because they've understood this, this key, this mystery. How we get there. Jesus said to the Sadducees in Matthew 22, 20, 29, when they asked him if a, a man who had multiple wives when he died, which one would he be married to when he got to heaven? And what did Jesus reply? You do not know the scriptures or the power of God. You do not know the scriptures or the power of God. The answer was, of course, that no one has given or taken in marriage in heaven. God said through the prophet Hosea, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. We have no excuse, folks. We have no excuse. We've got the manual for life. People often say to me, I know I have authority in the name of Jesus. Yes, you do, but authority isn't enough. Luke 9 verse 1, Jesus gave his disciples power and authority. Power and authority. Over how many demons? All demons and all diseases. The power of the Spirit changes you. It changes you. It changed the disciples who were hiding in the upper room out of fear. Having seen their, their Lord and Master crucified, the Holy Spirit came upon them. Peter, who, who was a coward and denied Christ, became like a bold lion. You see, people say to me, well, I'm not that kind of person. I'm an introvert. I don't, you know, I, 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 you know I'm not really that sort of person. And I said, well, that's fine. You can be what sort of person you like. It's the character of the Holy Ghost is what we're talking about. And the character of the Holy Ghost is as bold as a lion. When you're filled with the Spirit of God, you'll be in that character. When Jesus appeared to the disciples in John's Gospel, Oh, 
I think it's uh, John 20 at the end. You know, you do this in India and all of a sudden people start shouting out the scripture to you. Before you can get there, they're on it. Now when he had, uh, chapter 20, verse 22, and when he had said this, well, let's go, let's go back a bit from, uh, let's read from 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Now when he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said to them, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. You see, that's when they got born again, folks. That's when they got born again. They didn't get baptized with the Spirit then, but they got born again. If you forgive the sins of any, we see in Genesis, don't we, that God breathed on Adam and the spirit of life. God's life came into him. He breathed on them. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. We've said love has been reduced to a feeling. Let me tell you, so has forgiveness been reduced to a feeling. You don't have to feel forgiveness to give forgiveness. It's a decision of your will. You choose to forgive. I say that when I'm counseling people and say, people, I said, now forgive that person. And then they say, Lord, help me to forgive so and so. I said, no, 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 no. That's not forgiveness. He's already helped you forgive them. He's gone to the cross. You have to choose to forgive. Lord, I choose to forgive so and so. That's forgiveness. Do you see that? It's a huge difference. And it's one of the major causes of bondage to Christians after salvation. Jesus said it hands us over to the torturers. Who are the torturers? The tormentors, some translations say. What's that? It's demonic bondage. Unforgiveness, the Lord's Prayer says it all. Unforgiveness not only cancels out your own forgiveness, but it cancels out other people's. We've got to forgive folks. Now eventually, you say, well, yeah, but that, that hatred came back in. That's fine, it will. So you forgive again, and you forgive again, and you forgive again. And eventually, you will feel the forgiveness you're offering. Your soul will line up with your spirit man. Do you hear what I'm saying? Your soul will line up with your spirit man and you'll feel, and you won't have to cross the road anymore when that person's coming towards you. <laughs> and I often check forgiveness when I'm praying with folks. I said, now ask the Lord to bless them. Uh, Lord, uh, bless so and so. I can't ask the Lord to bless them. Yeah. Well, I said, well, you haven't forgiven, have you? <laughs> So, for, so important. And so then we say, see in the book of Acts, you see, uh, uh, on, on the day of Pentecost there, they're, they're all in the upper room, the Holy Spirit comes on them, it fires them up, they pour out into the street speaking in other tongues. It, it's the power of God. The power of God came up on them. You know, we, we just read in John 20, the power of God came in them. Justification for salvation. But the power of God has to come up on you. Just like the, the dove came upon Jesus. And the first miracle then was the uh, turning the wine in, in the wedding of Cana, uh, the water into wine. You see, it's the first domino to fall in the gifts of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit. And people say to me, well, I don't, you know, I don't need it. Well, you don't need it to watch EastEnders, no. <laughs> but uh, imagine going into battle. Uh, into warfare without a hand grenade, without a torch, without a map, without a knife, without a gun. They're the weapons of our warfare. And, and people say, oh, well, you, you have the gift of healing. No, it's the gifts, plural, and they're resident in the Holy Spirit, and any one of them can manifest and operate any time through any person. And rarely do they operate singularly. You need a word of knowledge. What am I dealing with, Lord, here? 
Is this, uh, is this illness? Is this a demonic bondage? I need a word of wisdom. How do I deal with this? Uh, you know, is this, it, does, does this need some come not out, but without prayer? And fit? Does, do they need to fast for this, Lord, to be free? Uh, what do they need to do for this, Lord? Uh, maybe they need to stop eating red meat. That's what the Lord said to one brother who had a lot of problems with gout, I think. The Lord gave him a word of knowledge. Don't eat so much red meat. And he was healed. Word of knowledge. Nobody had to pray for him. Just had to get his diet right. And, and so, you know, all, and then miracles, healings, they all flow together, you see. And so the, the first domino to fall is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we see in the book of Acts uh, that as uh, Peter goes to speak to the, uh, uh, the, the Gentiles, the Holy Spirit just fell upon them. Just fell upon them. Just what he was told. Nobody laid hands. Nobody spoke. He just sharing the gospel with them. And it came upon them. And he said, well, how can we, how, how, how can we deny them water baptism when, when we see that the same spirit on them is what was on us? I believe the early church, you got the whole package. If you read the word of God, Nobody got water baptized the day after they got saved in the War Chronicles of the Church, which is the book of Acts. Even the Philippian jailer in the middle of the night got water baptized. But what do we do here? We get, we get it on deposit. We get saved, and then a few years later, well, I, are you water baptized? No, I'm not. Well, I don't feel ready yet. What do you mean you don't feel ready yet? Are you born again? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't feel... Well, you know, if you're born again, get water baptized. Because you've got big chinks in your armor, and that's why you're not breaking through with God. You keep going back to your vomit because you haven't got the whole armor on. You don't understand the, the principal power of water baptism. Attending your own funeral. Choosing death before death chooses you. And then a few years later, after that, we might get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you know, or not. Uh, we need the whole deal, folks. We need the whole deal. And I believe it's key this morning uh, for where we're going to the rest of the day. And I want to offer this to folk here who uh, have never received that baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the baptizer. Uh, we're, the counselors here are going to lay hands on you to... Uh, uh, as a point of faith for you to release your faith to receive from him. Jesus said, if you ask your heavenly father for bed, would he give you a stone or a serpent? No. How much more would your heavenly father give you? We just have to ask and receive. How do you receive the baptism of the spirit? Same as you see salvation. Believed in your heart, confessed with your mouths. The problem is people don't receive because they don't confess. They don't confess. They began to talk. You begin to talk. And the Lord will give you the syllables. You've got to confess with your mouth. And receive by faith. Very, very important. So at this point now, I'm going to uh, <coughs> ask every head bowed and every eye closed. <coughs> I want to... Uh, I, I never, ever assume that we're all on the same page. I never assume ever everyone is born again. And so I want to ask, is anyone here who doesn't know the Lord as their saviour, who've never repented of their sin and called upon the name of Jesus that they might be saved? Is there one person here, or maybe you're backslidden, and you want this morning, you want to say, Lord, I want to come back to you. I, I want to come back to you, Father. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me once again, O oh God. Is there anyone here? Just raise your hand up if that's you and put it down again and I'll pray. Okay, you can put that down. Thank you. I see one hand. Is there anyone else who wants to say, Lord, I, I want to start this day right with you, oh God. I want to walk within the shadow of the cross. See another hand? You can put that down. That's it, folks. It's walking in the shadow of the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't we all pray this prayer together? 
Father God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that your word is life. Your word is truth. And your word says, All those who call upon your name shall be saved. I have called upon your name. I do call upon your name. This morning, I repent of all my sin. All my backsliding. In Jesus' name, I repent of all wickedness. In the name of Jesus, I receive that your word says that Jesus died for me, took my sin upon him, went to heaven, and now sits upon the right hand of God the Father, forever interceding for me. Thank you, Lord. Come into my heart. Take out my heart of stone. Put in a heart of flesh. Change the way I think. Change the way I act. In Jesus' name. I receive it. I believe it. And I thank you for it. Eternal life. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay. Well, now I'm going to uh, invite those who want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit to come forward and leave their seats. And we're going to pray with you to receive that. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer together. Uh, the counselor's going to come forward with me. Uh, we're going to lay hands on you. And then we're all going to pray in tongues together. And then we're going to sing in tongues together. Hallelujah. And, uh, and then we'll stop for coffee. But you might not be able to stop for coffee. Because, because my wife prayed for an elderly lady in her 80s who always wanted the baptism of the Spirit. And she went and prayed for her. And she received. And when we saw her the next day, she said, Oh my goodness, I thought I'd never speak English again. <laughs> and she ended up praying in the Spirit for hours. So who knows, maybe we won't get round to coffee. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, so folks, those who want to receive that blessing, uh, or maybe you received it and not used it. My mother, you know, she, she received it, and I said, Mum, are you using that gift? Oh, well, when I'm in the bath, I do. When you're in the bath? <laughs> you know, it's not meant for the bath. So maybe you've just been using it while you're in the bath, you know. You need that fired up. Come on. The Lord gave, uh, gave me one syllable uh, when I stood up very soon after I got saved at a full gospel dinner. Uh, and uh, it was Shalomar, Shalomar, Shalomar. And then a whole language started pouring out of me. And uh, let me tell you, it changed my life. It changed my life. The Bible came alive. The, the scriptures came alive. I was excited for God. I was on fire for the things of God. Uh, I used to see things behind people's lives. I got words of knowledge for people. I saw people healed and delivered. I've seen God move powerfully. And uh, I, I, I would find this such a drudgery without the gift of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Spirit. And uh, I just thank God that uh, it, it's equipping the body of Christ in this hour. Amen. Genesis Christian Ray.